Good morning, Mountain View, wherever you may be. Um, Josh, how hard is it to get that slide up here? I see this slide as uh, Nate was talking about the uh, youth group in Lynchburg, and it gave me flashbacks to uh, high school, the, the big hairy kid in the middle with the beard and the hat. Uh, I actually remember playing against a guy in high school sports, and you know, it's kind of intimidating when you've got a grown man that you're playing against, but uh, I thought that was funny. Um, there was a line in one of the songs that talked about turning fear into faith. Uh, and that's kind of where we're going today. But before I get there, if you wouldn't mind, just your bulletin, something, grab a pen. And on the front, somewhere where you can see it, write down two words, God's sovereignty. God's sovereignty. And hopefully I'll remember to come back to that. But it's been on my mind as I've been studying. Well, this morning we're going to pick up the uh, story of Jacob. Uh, we're starting in verse, chapter, 30, chapter 32 today. Um, if you've been here long enough, over the weeks that you, you've known that um, as we've looked at Jacob, he's a, he's a pretty flawed guy. Uh, he keeps making mistakes. He keeps causing crisis for himself. Um, uh, but if you, you may not be aware that in chapter 11 of Hebrews, it's called the Faith Hall of Fame. Jacob is actually listed there as one of the spiritual giants of our faith. Uh, these are people, spiritual people who, who God commends for the deeds that they accomplished. And he starts out each one, who by faith who by faith accomplished. And as we've looked at Jacob over the weeks, someone who by faith doesn't immediately come to mind when I'm describing Jacob. He's, he's anything but a hero of the faith. Uh, I take encouragement from guys like that, though, because Jacob, as we've seen, he doesn't start out there. He ends up there. And I'm not there, but that gives me encouragement that I could end up there. And you guys are the same way. You may not be where you think you should be. You may not measure up in your own mind. But trust me, by the end of the day, hopefully you'll see that God has a, a plan for you in God's sovereignty. Um, one commentator, as I was studying for today, referred to Jacob, and, and he used the analogy of uh, Jekyll and Hyde, Dr. Jekyll and Hyde, Mr. Hyde. Now, if you're like me, you've never actually read Robert Louis Stevenson's book, The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, but you understand any cultural analogy or cultural allusion that I might make to that. See, Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, we know is the classic story of, of good versus evil, right? Um, it's, a, it's a story of that battle, that nature within all of us that we all struggle with. Well, and since this book was a, a immensely popular when he wrote it 130 years ago and it's still considered a classic, um, it's not an, typically a, a, an original story. See, mankind from the beginning, we think of Cain and Abel, have struggled with that battle within us, that, that, that good versus evil, the, the compulsion to do good while also struggling with that compulsion to do wrong. Well, for the Christian, it takes a little added twist. Paul tells us that when we're, when we're saved, we get the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So now it's that Holy Spirit battling with self. In this case, it would be Mike, the Holy Spirit versus Mike, um, that, that old fleshly nature versus the new spiritual nature that we've been given. It, it's, it's a battle un, common to all of us as Christians. See, and I think Jacob is a pretty good example of that. I, I agree with the commentator because Jacob is really battling an eye infection. And you may say, oh, no, no, that's his father Isaac. Isaac was the one going blind. That's not what I'm talking about, that kind of an eye infection. See, Jacob, his motto is more, in me I trust. It's all about Jacob, self-preservation, self-promotion, have been his goals from the very beginning. And Jacob has been trying to accomplish on his own power the promise that God gave him at the very beginning. If you remember, before he was born, God promised that the younger son, Jacob, would rule over the older son, Esau. And Jacob's been doing everything he can since that time to make that, that promise come true. Well, as we pick up the story in chapter 32, you'll recall that uh, a few weeks ago, Jeff commended Jacob for being obedient to God to leave Uncle Laban and head home. And that's a good starting point for Jacob. But today I think we'll see that it's really a, the hinge today uh, that turns Jacob from a man of self to a man of God. See, if you recall, as Jacob's heading home, he's heading towards someone, and that's his brother Esau. Now, if you recall again, at the very beginning of the series, Jacob had stolen Esau's birthright, and by birthright, that... that entitled Esau to be the patriarch of the clan upon Isaac's death. He would be the head of the, the family at, at that point. 
But Jacob wasn't content with that. He also stole his blessing, which would be Jake, uh, Esau's inheritance. First son would typically get twice the portion of the younger. So Jacob stole his birthright, the head of the clan, and his blessing, which would be his inheritance. And if you can imagine, that caused just a little bit of animosity, I would think, between the brothers, right? In fact, in one of the last scenes that we saw Esau, he had made a vow to kill Jacob. He was just a little upset. So today we'll see in chapter 32 again that, that Jacob takes this huge step in the development of his, his own faith. See, up to now, every time he's prayed, part of it's cultural, but I also believe that Jacob hasn't really owned his own faith yet. But each, every time he prays, it would be to the God of his father, Abraham, or the God of his father, Isaac. And today we're going to see that he changes a little bit. So picking up in verses 1 and 2, it says, Jacob also went on his way, and the angels of God met him. When Jacob saw them, he said, this is the camp of God. So he named that place Mahanaim. See, I think God chose to reveal himself to Jacob at this particular point because he's heading to someone who he knows has an intense dislike for him. And by doing this, God's given him a promise that he hasn't forgotten Jacob. See, I think that as Jacob is recalling the promise uh, to be, to be um, um, blessed, that he needs now, as he faces the biggest hurdle in his life, a promise of God's presence. And along with that pro presence, um, God provides uh, or promises to provide for and protect him, to fulfill that promise. So again, approaching Esau is probably the greatest challenge Jacob has faced at this point. Um, and God is gracious enough to give him that, that promise and his, and his presence. So picking up verses 3 and 8, 3 through 8, Jacob develops this plan a plan which, I don't have time to read them all, but verses 13 through 21, he actually implements this plan. So he comes up with this plan as he's heading uh, towards Esau, and this meeting with Esau looms. So picking up in verse 3, it says, Jacob sent messengers ahead of him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. He instructed them, this is what you are to say to my lord Esau. Your servant Jacob says, I have been staying with Laban and have remained there till now. I have cattle and donkeys, sheep and goats, male and female servants. Now I am sending this message to my Lord that I may find favor in your eyes. When the messengers returned to Jacob, they said, We went to your brother Esau, and now he's coming to meet you, and 400 men are with him. In great fear and distress, Jacob divided the people who were with him into two groups, and the flocks and herds and camels as well. He thought, If Esau comes and attacks one group, the group that is left may escape. Well, now I want you to understand there's a few flaws with this plan, right? Um, the first is that he divides his possessions uh, and he sends them along to Esau. And the scripture says, why? Hoping basically to buy him off so that it'll cause no harm. He says that I may find favor in my brother's sight. Now, there is a good message here about restoring a relationship, a broken relationship with a brother. I don't have time to go there. Um, but let's look at these, these flaws here. He divides those possessions, and as Jeff reminded us a few weeks ago, two weeks ago, God had blessed Jacob with an uncountable number of goats and sheep uh, in order to, to send him on his way and that he would be provided for. So as we look at this, Jacob is sending the blessings that God had provided him to appease his brother. So Jacob, I, I suggest to you this morning that if you're leaking blessings, if, you're, if your, bucket, uh, your blessing bucket is leaking, so to speak, maybe it's because you're depending on your own plan and you haven't trusted God uh, with the promise that he's given you. So Jacob sent, divides his possessions. He sends them on ahead. But then he does something else, too. He divides his family. He sends them ahead. And he'd come back in the rear, you know, just, just in case. Well, guys, let me, let me tell you, as the head of the household, um, the guy that's charged with protecting your family, this is the cowardice way out, right? You send your family ahead of you, and I'll bring up the rear, just in case. Again, Jacob operating in, in a mode of self-preservation. Um, just in case Esau is that angry, then, then Jacob is pres um, protected. And I don't want you to get the wrong idea, because Scripture actually commends making plans. Proverbs says, a prudent man sees danger and plans accordingly. But the problem with Jacob, and I think it's the chief problem, the biggest problem that he makes, other than these two flaws, is that he didn't seek God's will first. He didn't consult God one time. 
One commentator suggested, and I happen to agree, that if Jacob had pursued God and his plan for this reconciliation with Esau, that he would have been able to keep all those blessings that God had given him in the first place. So he gave away things unnecessarily that God had provided to him. So picking up a little bit in the, in the text, Genesis 32, 6, we get Esau's response from the servants that are returning. And the first thing we notice is Esau is coming with 400 men. Now let me tell you what this is not. This is not Esau being so excited at the return of his younger brother that he's bringing 400 guys to come and have a barbecue celebrating Jacob's return. Now if anything, this is Esau coming back to make Jacob the barbecue. <laughs> he's, he's in a hot spot, okay? This isn't a good thing. 400 men in the scriptures is usually a war party. And Jacob knows this. That's why in the text we read that Jacob was distressed. He was afraid. Um, and again, Jacob, what makes it worse, he knows he's wrong. He knows what he did. He knows that he stole Esau's birthright. He stole his blessing. So this added guilt is weighing on him as well. So regardless of what Esau's reasoning was, this doesn't look like it's going to end up well for Jacob. As I said, it mentions that Jacob uh, is in great fear and distress. And I can only imagine, as the servants come back, Jacob's questions. Did he look mad? Was he upset? Does he still want to kill me? I can only imagine that sense of foreboding and the weight that it puts on Jacob. But then Jacob does something that he should have done from the very beginning. He prays. And I think Jacob, in this case, is a perfect example of the pattern that we too often find ourselves in. Things are going wrong, and then we'll pray as a last resort. See, Jacob feels that full weight of the impending disaster, and to this point, he's done what he's always done. He's played the odds. He's making deals. Uh, he's still trying to come out on top. And if God has crossed his mind at all up to this point, it's usually to try to make a deal with him. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, let's go back to chapter 28, verses 20 through 22, where it re records uh, Jacob's first prayer. It says, Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking, and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's household, then the Lord will be my God, and his stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give a tenth. Well, now, before you begin poking fun at Jacob's little bargain there, if you do this and that, then I'll do this. I can remember even as an unsaved person making those kind of bargains with God, and I'm sure you did too. God, if you help me make this basket, I'll believe in you. Or God, if you give me this, then I'll do this. We're all guilty of that. And Jacob's no different up to this point. But then we see in verse 9 and verse 12, and I'm thoroughly convinced that this is the pivot point. This is where Jacob begins to change. His prayer goes, Then Jacob prayed, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, Lord, you who said to me, Go back to your country and your relatives, and I will make you prosper. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan, but now I have become two camps. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid he will come and attack me, and also the mothers with their children." But you have said, I will surely make you prosper and will make your descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. I just suggest a simple maxim in life right now. See, we can either choose to let our crisis handle us or we can choose to let God handle our crisis. See, up until now, it appears that Jacob, as I said, doesn't really appear to have owned his own faith. But this time, Jacob offers a real prayer. Oh, he's still got, like we do, a lot of growing and maturing to do. Uh, but this is where his faith becomes his faith. See, Jacob's initial reaction to Esau's apparently hostile, hostile advance against him was to try to protect himself. That was Jacob's standard response to every problem that he had suffered or faced at, up to this point. Yet this time, he knew it wasn't enough. This is where, in me I trust, finally becomes in God I trust. And it starts with two aspects in this prayer. I want to look at the first one. It says, But you said, I will certainly make you prosper and will make your descendants like the sand on the seashore, too numerous to count. 
You need to hear the passion as Jacob prays. In the Hebrew, we've kind of watered down a little bit, but you said, in the Hebrew, you is emphasized. So Jacob finally comes to the point where he realizes that it's only because of God and through God that the promise will be made. He says, but you, you promised, fully depending on God and fully recognizing that he needs to become uh, humbly submissive to God and, and in turn, turn in total dependence on the God who made the promise. See, the God who made the promise is the same God who revealed himself in the first two chapters, uh, two, first two verses. And in order to fulfill the promise, again, God has promised his presence and his protection to fulfill that promise. We need to come to that same place in our own lives. The God who has promised is present and will protect. Again, in his prayer, the second aspect, there's a recognition of his own unworthiness. He says, I'm unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. Notice what's promised here on display. Because up to now, Jacob has made a mess in his own life. God promises to bless, and that's the title, right? Blessed and messy. Well, Jesus himself in the Beatitudes uh, preached, told us who would be blessed. And I'm just going to read two of them. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. So poor in spirit and those who mourn. What do these things mean? It's simply this. Even in our own lives, we can make big messes. I've made messes. You've made messes. We're going to make messes as we try to do it on ourselves. But Jesus himself says someone will be blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit and those who mourn. It's those people who recognize their own sinful, corrupt nature and utter helplessness and who recognize that their need for full submission to and redemption by the risen Jesus Christ. It's those who will be blessed. When we finally reach that point, and it's the, uh, what Jacob evidences in his prayer, it's a humility. I'm not worthy is how now Jacob's confession in place of that self-confidence and the bargaining, right? But Jacob has no way to manipulate God, and he knows it. So God's promises are the only basis upon which he can make his petition. I'm going to ask the guys to play a song as I read through Jacob, and I see this changing in, in Jacob's life from uh, in me I trust to in God I trust. I can only... I, I hear this song, and I, and I imagine this is what's taking place in, in Jacob's mind, and it's going taking place in Jacob's mind. I think it'll probably resonate with you. I don't know what the writer of that song was facing. I don't know what you're facing this morning. We all have our own Esau. I don't know a relationship, broken relationship. I don't know if it's a health crisis of some type. What I do know is that the only way we overcome these things is to learn, as Jacob did, full submission on the one who can bring us through the crisis. You know, the Jekyll and Hyde story, the only way that uh, Dr. Jekyll could be rid of Mr. Hyde is to kill him. Well, of course, as he kills Mr. Hyde, Dr. Jekyll dies too, right? Jacob learned that the only way he could learn to rely fully on God is to kill that se same self sense of self-preservation and self-promotion. And for the Christian, the New Testament is quite clear. The only way we learn to fully walk in the Spirit is to die daily to self, not a literal death, but to learn to crucify our own sinful desires. You know, I brought up the word God's sovereignty, and that's where I'd like to go now. And I don't want to step too badly on uh, Trudy and Megan next week, but, and you have to come out, come back next week to find out the... Uh, the, what, what I'm referring to, I, I hope to pique your interest, but Jacob doesn't come out of this unscathed. Uh, something actually happens to Jacob. And if you guys can run that slide, you know, Valerie and I, we love the Southwest. Uh, and every time I go through, uh, go out there, you know, you see this landscape and it's just incredibly beautiful landscape. But the thing is, it's actually a scar. Uh, it's the reason they recur, refer to it as a scab lands. Creation geologists, uh, secular geologists, they'll all agree that at one time a, a large body of water covered the area. And for whatever reason, tectonics, um, uh, uplift in the earth, the water ran off and it scoured the landscape. So what we're seeing actually is scarred landscape. But to me, again, it's some of the most beautiful 
countryside you'll ever see. So where does God's sovereignty come in that? I just say this to say, you may be walking through your crisis, your trial, your tribulation, and you may not come out unscathed. But God in his sovereignty, he'll use it. And he'll use it in at least three ways. I'm, I'm, I'm going to give this to you. He'll use it in at least three ways. And it makes us beautiful in his eyes. See, you may go through this crisis. And as I said with Jacob, he encourages me. When I see somebody as messed up as Jacob is, and I look at my own life, to know that there's hope to become like Jacob and become a hero of the faith. You may be in the same place. You may look around the sanctuary. You may see Mark up here preaching every week. You figure he's got it all together. I don't think he minds me telling you he doesn't, okay? Um, but you take encouragement from people that have already walked through the trials, and you see they've come out on the other side, and they're normal, and they're healthy, and God's using them. The second way is, as Paul said, we're familiar with the verses that uh, your grace is sufficient for me. See, God didn't choose to take away his impairment, but God, it taught Paul to submit to, to uh, Jesus, right? He depended on him for his grace and his security. And that's what it does for us too. As we walk through things, we learn to cling to uh, Jesus with all of our heart. And the third way is the scripture tells us that we are to comfort with the comfort that we've been given. So if you've never walked through anything, you can't have comfort, right? So we're to use those things that we walk through. That's God's sovereignty. And you see it throughout the story of Jacob. Jacob's the character that we've been studying, but God's sovereignty is the biggest thing here I want you to get today. Because Jacob, he swindled his brother. That's a bad thing. But the blessing was, because of the swindling and the vow to kill him, he went to Uncle Laban to get a wife. Well, he wanted Rachel, and he ends up with Leah and Rachel, which causes its own problems. But here's the blessing there. If he'd have just stuck with Rachel, the line of Jesus comes through Leah's kid, Judah. So again, God's providence. He'll use the messes that we've caused for his own purposes to advance his kingdom. Amen? The band, if you guys want to come up, that would be great. One more thing as I close. You know, I mentioned I love the Southwest. Grand Canyon is probably my favorite place on the earth. Um, I know Jeff and Susie, they hiked through. Valerie and I did it a couple years ago. But I read, on average, most people go to the edge of the Grand Canyon. That's as far as they go, and they spend 15 minutes. Now, that's good, and you get a sense of the awe, but I want to tell you, you don't fully appreciate the Grand Canyon until you've gone down in, and you see the immensity, the size. You see the little tributaries coming off from the side, the, the cold, rushing water. You wouldn't expect in the middle of 107-degree de heat to find 60-degree water, the Colorado River, whatever. But again, as you look from the bottom to the top, you get a whole new appreciation for just how immense the canyon is. And I think our faith walk is like that too. We, you know, we come in here, and I'm not bashing anybody. I'm just encouraging you. We spend 15 minutes kind of on the sidelines with God, and we admire what he does, but we don't fully immerse ourselves in him to learn truly how magnificent and inspiring he is. So let's go ahead and pray, and then I'll turn it over to these guys. God, I appreciate your sovereignty. God, that even though in the middle of crisis I crumble and fold a lot of times, or I try to do it in my own strength and I make a mess. God, help us to rely on that promise that you are there. You've promised us to never leave nor forsake us, even to the end of the age. You've given us your spirit to indwell, so not only are you present with us, you're present in us. God, help us not to walk in fear, but in faith and in power. Help us, like Jacob, to turn that corner to cling to you and fully submit to you, to honor you, to glorify you. God, if there's an unbeliever here today, as I was at one time, having to go through a crisis to bring me to you, God, bring that crisis. If there's a believer in here now who's just kind of spending his 15 minutes or her minute, 15 minutes on the sidelines, God, we pray, bring that crisis so that we can draw closer to you to have a fuller, healthier faith as we submit to your humble leadership, your guidance. Draw us closer to you through everything that you use, God. We just commit this time to you. We give you thanks for loving us in spite of ourselves sometimes. 
It's in Jesus' name we pray.